Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening for those online joining us from other time zones. It is such a pleasure to see all of you here and to know so many of you are joining us online from wherever else you are in the world. My name is Suzanne Suggs and I'm the chair of the summer school. And this is my third year in this role, but it's my first year to be able to welcome you to Lugano and to hold our first ever hybrid version of the summer school. I hope you all had safe travels and made it here peacefully. I understand there's been a few flight delays and we'll have some people joining us later today, but I hope things went rather, rather smoothly for you. So I wanted to start the morning off by just with some of my own reflections on where we are in public health today and where we go moving forward. And then I will introduce to you this curriculum, the program that we have designed for the, for the week, the colleagues who are behind the scenes who have helped design this program. And then we have two amazing public health leaders and experts in public health leadership who are going to share their perspectives with us on public health leadership today and in the future. So the way I see it is that public health is changing. And it's changing drastically, dramatically, and at a very rapid speed. It's changing in ways that have not been so blatantly apparent until very recently. And this process is particularly evident related, related to climate change and all of the effects that climate change brings with it. Health is much more politicized, it's conflictual, and it's irrational as evidence-based approaches and practices are being challenged, they're being replaced with lies, deception, and misinformation. There's a declining public trust in health institutions, organizations, and practices. And there's an increasing lack of willingness to learn from the past. In a fundamental way, Many people and organizations are attacking public health because they claim it constrains their individual freedoms. This is completely false because health and well being are some of the most important and necessary attributes for people to achieve security, freedom, and prosperity. The future of public health is going to be characterized by vastly new problems and challenges. And we need public health leaders. We need populations of people who understand why public health is so important to everything we do and what we don't do. Public health is going to need to change to deal with this changing world. Some of the changes I think that we need to, we need to make are that we need more engagement in political and public affairs. And this is gonna be very important for public health actors. We need to have involvement and investment in the policy process and the business world. Both of these are essential. As Plato famously said, the price good men pay for indifference to public affairs is to be ruled by evil men. We need to encourage, motivate and engage young people. So they choose a career, they choose a life, that embraces public health. They want public health education. And we've already started to do this. We're in discussions already on how we can get young people much more involved in the summer school. So I welcome any ideas you have about how to get young people involved. We need to recognize the importance of culture and even pop culture on public health. We've started that also this year with our first ever Swiss Global Health Film Festival organized by some of our PhD students. And I hope you will attend the three films this week. We need to evaluate and, uh, and assess our practices and behaviors that you can control, those behaviors that you can control. And we need to seek to reduce our carbon footprint. We need to embody behaviors that reduce climate change. Just to name a few, your diet, the clothes that you buy or don't buy, your travel choices. In fact, this is our 31st edition of the summer school. 
It is our first hybrid edition. And we have over 100 people who are joining us online from other parts of the world. And while I know that you probably would like to be here, and believe me, it's spectacular. Let me give you just a quick taste of what it looks like here in the spring. Fantastic people here joining us from also all over the world. And very happy to be here. But I want to applaud you all who are online. You are helping to reduce the carbon footprint of the summer school. And I can tell you, Greta would approve. And I can also promise you all that this week may have some hiccups. We may have some challenges with the hybrid version, but I can promise you as long as I am chair of the summer school, we're gonna to continue to make hybrid a priority because we reach more people spreading public health practices and best, best practices and research and experiences. And we're gonna make it better and better every year. So I want your feedback on how it goes, some of the challenges, but also some of the ideas that you have on how to make this hybrid learning more, more and also better for everyone going forward. So let me summarize by saying, you know, first, these are my perspectives, a little bit gloom and doom, but believe me, I'm very much an optimist. And one of the things that makes me optimistic is this program that has been prepared this week in addition to the course that took place last week in social media. So let me just walk you through a little bit of this program. First and foremost, 195 participants are joining us. This is the most ever in the history of the summer school, coming from 62 different countries. 200 and, sorry, 288 enrollments. So many of you are taking multiple courses. That's how that math works. But behind all of this is a fantastic team. The steering committee and the, and the staff have made the summer school possible. I wanna just give acknowledgement quickly to Professor Nino Kunsley, who is the Dean of the SSPH Plus. Carlo Di Pietro is here in the audience, also a fantastic steering committee will be a member, will be here with us all week. So, Sabiel Obrecht is here somewhere. She might be in the back there still. Thank you, Sabiel. Dr. Sandra Axel, um, of course, Camila, who is the coordinator here based in Lugano and the super coordinator. Thank you so much, Camila. And Camila, she's making sure that your experience here in Lugano is as wonderful as it can be. And also for those of you online as well. So we also have amazing course assistants. So every, almost every course this week has an assistant. And these are the spectacular people who will be helping you and those of you online. Uh, have a, a good experience, I hope, and manage technology and manage chats and Zooms and so forth. Please, if you have any questions or problems during your course, your course assistant is the, is the person to go to. Courses. We have 15 courses this year. We planned 15 and we're holding 15. Not one has been canceled. Not one did not make, which is historically not the case. We all usually have to cancel one or two. Quick overview. I think most of you know the curriculum but we have fantastic courses, including one about learning from the past. We have courses that'll help people understand how complex behavior changes, about the impact of air pollution, about public health leadership, about wealth inequalities and social mobility and health, about responding to disasters and the importance of humanitarian logistics, just to name a few. We have 50 course facilitators in these 15 courses. So you're all going to get to meet a lot of great people who have experiences from around the world. Let's put some pictures with those names. And we have plenary sessions like the one we're having today. The world needs public health leadership. Tomorrow morning, we're gonna hear a lot about misinformation and the infodemic and how to deal with that. Then we're gonna have another session on health policy planning, decisions in times of uncertainty with a fantastic case study from Colombia building resistance through healthcare financing uh, reforms, lessons from Ukraine. We're also going to have a celebration of Ukraine on their Independence Day on Wednesday. We're gonna hear about the long and the short of long, the long and short of long COVID, non-communicable diseases, and food, water, and climate change. 
Plenary speakers also are incredibly amazing people with diverse backgrounds and certainly the expertise that, we'll, that we will uh, really appreciate hearing from. Again, I mentioned that we have the, the film festival. So we have three films this week, Monday night. Tonight we have the first one. It's a very short film followed by a, a panel discussion. On Tuesday night, we have a film to show um, called The Pro uh, Prosecutors that deals that focuses on the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. And then on uh, Friday, we have a film in the evening called Hunger War, which focuses on using starvation as a method of war, as a weapon of war. For all the participants, um, we also have evening events tonight after the film. We'll go down to the Lido on, on the lake and, uh, and enjoy each other's company. On Wednesday evening, we have the Independence Day of Ukraine celebration, where we're going to celebrate culture and food and music. We have a concert even uh, with Ukrainian music. Thursday, we'll have an event for, uh, to prevent NCDs. And then Friday, we'll end the week, in, almost end the week, um, at Porto Bello, which is also on the lake with an aperro after, uh, after the film. So I'm optimistic, and we have a great program that I know is going to help you deal with those challenges that I mentioned a few moments ago. Last week, I had a great opportunity to, have a, to hold an interview with Dr. Giorgio Morlani. He's the chief medical officer of this canton, of our state here, a Canton Ticino, and a longtime supporter of the summer school. So I, did a, I, I, I sat down with him in his office last week, and I want to share with you some of the things that we discussed. Oof, <laughs> you start with an easy question. Um, what, what are the problems in, in public health? Mm -hmm. I think we, we should start uh, with this question and to find the right answer to those problems. I think that the problems we have in public health are quite different in different regions of the world. There are common, common uh, bases, common problems everywhere, but if I think um, and non-communicable diseases, uh, overweight, uh, uh, diabetes, it's rather a problem of one part of the, of the world. Uh, if I think about uh, transmissible diseases, it's rather a problem of another part of the world. Although the last years changed with the pandemics, which showed uh, this, this, uh, this paradigm shift uh, almost. So what is the most uh, important um, problem in public health now? If we try to put everything on a one, one, one point, I think is communication. I think communication was, is one of the central point. Either way, uh, communicating the right way and trying to face also the problem with the fake news, which has become really important in the last in the last years, and also communication between leaders, and also communication between science and politics, between politics and citizen. I think communication is becoming more and more a central issue. A mistake, <laughs> actually a mistake. Uh, almost led me to, to this role. No, I did not think about about public health when I was a student. Y you, ha you have so a kind of old-fashioned ima uh, imagine of, of what the, the doctor is, of what all the physicians are. Uh, I, I was rather than thinking about surgery, about, about tropical uh, health also. And then I started my, my I did my studies, my internship uh, as an internal medicine specialist, and then an a ED, ID specialist, infectious diseases. And after that, I was, uh, I was just working a day at the hospital, and I got a phone call, um, which asked me about if I was interested about this, this, uh, this pos possibility of becoming the chief medical officer, because the former chief medical officer, which is now the president of the Swiss Confederation, uh, was leaving his, his, uh, his job. Uh, and that was the first time I actually played with the idea of, of becoming uh, chief medical officer and, and working for public health. 
So it was rather a mistake, rather a choice of everybody else which led me into it. And I just decided to, 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 to learn about a little bit more about public health and then I was so fascinated about the idea. And I must admit, I, I worked for years at hospitals. After one, two, three years at the hospital, you, you can't become bored about what you're doing. It's now 14 years I'm working for the public health and every day it's a new day. It's something new and interesting. It's, it's incredible. It's, it's so a broad uh, job you can do and it's so interesting, it's so rewarding uh, uh, in a way you cannot even imagine. We always say that it's better to prevent rather than to cure, but what we are really doing is exactly the opposite. We are curing, we are waiting, we have a problem, then we will face it, even with the pandemic. We were talking just years about uh, the, 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 the risk of having a pandemic. We knew it would come, it came, and nobody was ready. Nobody was really, really uh, prepared for the, for the, for the pandemic. Um, I think that the, the human mind is rather set in solving problems when, when they have it rather than to anticipate and to prepare to, 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 to avoid uh, problems uh, in the future. And it's also an economic question. I think it's, it's crazy. The, the money we are investing in curing medicine uh, or in medicine that cures rather than trying to invest a little bit more in avoiding to have diseases to cure later. <laughs> would be, it would make much more sense. But if you go and check how much money we are investing in, in curative medicine and preventive medicine, it's, it's, it's astonishing. It's, it's one to, one to 10,000, one to 100,000. The, the, the relationship be, between curing and be, between uh, preventing. So what can we change? I don't know. I don't know. I think that every never waste a good crisis. This crisis showed that the cure of managing a crisis afterwards is much more, um, it's much less cost effective, costs much more than trying to prevent and to, to, to um, act before the problem uh, uh, that we will face. And we can translate this, 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 this phenomenon in every uh, sector of, of public health and even in politics. Uh, uh, we can even talk about climate change afterwards if you, if you want. Because that, that, that's the same question. We always act too late when this is uh, much more complicated and it costs much more. There is not, it's not possible to change one single behavior which makes this huge difference. Uh, I think uh, it depends also on the country, on the region, because somewhere uh, the road traffic accident are killing more people than, than diabetes elsewhere. Uh, so uh, quit smoking might be interesting and very, very um, effective in, 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 in certain population, but less in others. Um, maybe other 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 population, other other countries, uh, air pollution has much uh, much bigger impact. Uh, alcohol drinking, uh, checking your blood pressure, whatever. There are so many different things. But if I could pick only one, which really makes a difference globally, is all the behavior we make and the politician make about climate change because climate change is going to kill everybody in the future so if we don't react there there will be no future i, th I think it's a quite broad because uh, you need the science to understand the problem 
to talk to the specialist because even if you are a chief medical officer, you are not specialist in every single detail of health. But you, you have the knowledge, you, 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 you have the know-how, you have the connections. You have to understand science. You have to have connections. You have to, to be somehow credible because this is what leads you to, um, to, to interact with people and to be able to make changes, I think. I think you have to have also communication skills because you have to be able to communicate to your peers, communicate to the politics, communicate to the people which uh, at the end of the day is the, are those who change their behaviors and act the right way or the wrong way. You should al also be quite comfortable with the, with the, with the administration, with the, with the functioning of the system so that you know how to interact and which um, which um, buttons to touch to try to change things. So it's, it's quite a broad, different kind of, 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 of knowledge based on hard skills, knowledge, but also many soft skills. First of all, I'm so sorry I cannot attend <laughs> because, you know, as you know, I attended many times. I, I like it. I love it. it. It's a really good way to, 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 to get the knowledge, to build up your skills and, uh, and, and what you know, but also to interact uh, with many people, uh, to make connections, uh, which can be useful also for the future. And it's so interesting to hear from different countries what the problems there are and where, how the problems um, um, have been solved. I think it's incredible if you think Ticino is 350,000 uh, people living in there, but from the uh, point of view of public health, what, what we already have done also with, uh, um, we were the starting members of this interaction uh, with the with, uh, World Health Organization about, about public health on the, on the municipalities level uh, with this public health school. Um, so it's, it's, it's good to know that we, uh, we, we, are, we are turning 31, uh, but I think the future is still bright. Next, I would like to invite Kasha to the stage. Kasha is the Chair of Public Health Leadership and Workforce Development in the Department of International Healthcare and Public Health Research Institute at Maastricht University. And I am so glad that you were here. Kasha has been with the Lugano Summer School many times, but it has been a few years since we've been able to, uh, to have the pleasure of, of bringing her back to Lugano. So I'm gonna just turn the camera around so that those online can see you. So good morning and good morning to those who are online. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So good. It's so, very sensitive. Good morning. I feel really privileged that I'm here today with you. And as you've heard, it is not the first time. Although I work in Maastricht, I am collaborating with the University of Basel and the Lugano Summer School, and it has been a great experience. And today I will talk to you about public health leadership and why we need public health leaders. I think that some of the things that I will be saying will resonate with what you have heard before. So let me start. I'll, on purpose, I took a picture <laughs> with the glacier because it's very hot, but actually leadership is about bridging and moving to a better future. Sometimes we take others with us. Sometimes we have to be alone. And remember that leader can be sometimes a very lonely figure. At the same time, what we have experienced now in the world is working differently means leading differently. During the pandemic, we have experienced that a lot of us worked in isolated places alone, and leaders had to make sure that 
those who are far away still deliver and are motivated. It is an important skill that you need to have in this world. And our Lugano Summer School now continues in the hybrid fashion. So there is something good coming out of it. And we need leaders because there are a lot of challenges as well. And the challenges like the pandemic, like climate change, or conflicts, war, that are so interconnected and actually have impact on everything in our life. And sometimes we don't even realize when a change or conflict or something else can impact the life of people and the things we are doing globally. It is an example of the pandemic, but you can relate to other aspects. And as a leader, you need to be prepared and you need to be a system thinker to know what can be the consequences of the decisions that are taken and how they impact locally and globally. So public health leadership, we need leaders. The need for leaders is too great to leave their emergence to chance. And that was already said at the beginning of the 80s by the Institute of Medicine and then later in 2009. Richard Horton, in two, uh, who is the chief editor of The Lancet in 2011 said that politicians are divorced from science and they sit in governments and they know that what they are deciding about is sometimes a corrupt deal. They need to understand public health and have courage to act. This is something they need to do. So we really need leaders. And that is pronounced by a lot of health policy documents issued by WHO, by the European Commission, and by the governments of different countries where leadership and the fact that we need to include leadership is central. So, how do we develop the leaders? And what is the leadership in contemporary times? The times I would call them post-truth and post-values times, where we actually don't know what is good, what is bad anymore sometimes. We have to rely on ourselves. I will also say something about leadership in all policies, like we say health in all policies developing public health leaders and transformational and compassionate leadership. So let's find out how. <laughs> and my first thing would be to relate a little bit to you personally. When we start talking about leadership, let's talk about our own journey because leadership is a journey. And when you think about your personal leadership journey, you start with level one, personal leadership. We all lead ourselves. And what it means to lead yourself. It, me it, it means that you need to have ability to explore what you really want to achieve, your own aspirations, your needs, your value system, what you are fine with, and what you are not found with. At the same time, you also need to have some organizational qualities, managerial skills. And this is the first level of leadership. Who is on this level? We, <laughs> we all are, yes, good. Then you move and then there is interpersonal leadership. And then it means that you have the willingness and ability to formally or informally lead others in teams, in groups, in clubs, maybe in sports clubs. So that is a little bit of interpersonal skills, openness to another human being. Who is on the second level? <laughs> okay, good. And then you move further, if you are lucky, or if you want, and then you can lead other leaders. 
and there you require slightly different skills because all of the people that you work with are moving in the, to the same direction, trying to lead others. Yes. And how to share, how to share experiences, how you can help colleagues exchange and move better. Who is leading other leaders? <laughs> All right. And then if you want, yes, or if it is your leadership goal, you move to the fourth level, which is leading systems, leading organizations, leading change. Who is leading systems, leading organizations, leading change? Okay, <laughs> great. So this is just for you to reflect before we go further. So leadership and public health leadership. Uh, I'm thinking of some people that you know from history that actually when I show a picture, you think about specific qualities that leaders have, like Mother Teresa, devotion, yes, helping poor people, yes, being kind, and at the same time, very fragile. When we think of Gandhi, and the picture that I uh, brought here is showing someone who is like the people he serves, looking very poorly, right? But at the same time, maybe there is a better understanding, poor, but at the same time, very strong. And then Nelson Mandela, he has a perseverance, being steadfast to the convictions, no matter what, you persevere and you go. And then there are some challenge, uh, challenging leaders, yes, who want to do something that really uh, will put a dent in the universe. Otherwise, there is no need to be a leader. But there are also some kind of strange, suddenly appearing leaders, and we are talking about climate change, and there is a young person, a leader, who, is, who, who opposes the situation that we have now. Or there are people who work in the fluid, the people who are on the uh, ground floor among us, volunteers who are sparing their life to help others in the time of crisis. And we often don't know about them, but we should give them credit. There are people who are involved in the war conflicts, who are trying to be with their people and do the best they can. And there is always war, there is always conflict. And the, the fact that there is conflict, we need to know there is interconnectedness also with the climate change. And there are women leaders. And this uh, it's a very nice article in the Guardian that showed that women were able to address the COVID pandemic in a very effective way, because they have a kind of interesting blend of qualities on one hand, scientific, evidence-based, and on the other hand, empathy. And they were quite successful. But when we talk about leaders, we also may think of celebrities who get involved, yes, to bring better life for human beings. But that's what all these pictures have in common, that we see leaders who help people. There is a very strong, human factor. Not the, we don't need heroes sitting somewhere, yes, far away from the people, that's over. Okay, so these are probably uh, pictures that resonate with something and you have examples of your own leaders or people that you think can be named as such, but let us go to leadership, the topic of today's lecture. There are plenty of definitions, <laughs> and I just chose one, that it is the process of influencing others to go together to reach one goal and objective together. It's a very important definition, and actually that's what it is. But what is public health leadership? And I had, was doing a lot of uh, interviews with public health leaders. And this is one of the definitions that I have 
uh, obtained from Sir Professor Nicholas Wald in 2017. And this definition actually resonates with what our colleague who was interviewed has said that leadership in public health is to make sound public health decisions and then to implement changes necessary to achieve the public health benefit. It rests on achievement rather than process and should focus on the prevention of disease rather than the treatment of disease. We couldn't agree more. Yes, so that is the leadership in public health. But let us go further. And here I would like to share with you the studies that I have carried out. And this is like a, a little summary of the interviews that I carried out with public health leaders. And it turned out that what matters is the context where you are a leader, where you want to make a change. So public health context and what it is. And then a kind of the core category that all leaders related to was that they want to benefit society and improve well-being. And Suzanne, today at the beginning of uh, her speech, said that this is what we are looking for, improving their well-being, yes, and benefiting society. Then there were four more categories. The leaders were talking about emerging types of leadership, new types of leadership that we need for contemporary times. And these are really horizontal leadership. We don't want any top-down leadership anymore. You need to bring uh, many stakeholders to the table and work together across sectors across organizations, across disciplines. So it has to be a radically different types of leadership, also adaptive. Then what leaders need to do in the future, a future imperative. And what is quite interesting is that they want to support education and training. And again, it resonates with what uh, the, our interviewee said, connect science, policy, and practice. The essence of leadership is respect for diversity and look, coaching, mentoring other leaders. So there is a moment in the development of the leader when you need to think of those whom you left leave behind. And then content matter knowledge. So you need to be an expert and you need to think out of the box. But at the same time, your inner path is demonstrating courage and you need to be steadfast to your values. So this is something that I learned from the leaders, but I have also interviewed specifically women leaders. And these uh, women work in public health and in uh, healthcare organizations. Uh, these are some of the experts of the interviews that I have some. And now women leaders, what they said. I interviewed around uh, 40 women leaders from all over the world. And again, it turned out that healthcare leadership context is most important. So where you work, what you do. And the core category for female leaders is balance. They were repeating very often that most difficult and most important is to strike the balance between your personal life and between your professional life, between being strong and being vulnerable. So women were always balancing on the verge. Female challenges, lack of self-confidence, and sometimes marginalization in the organization, a lot of barriers related to diversity, culture, gender, age, and balancing various responsibilities. But at the same time, we talk about the added value of female leadership. It's not that who is better, who is worse. Women add value. And this is that we are flexible with setbacks, we are able to keep a bigger picture while multitasking. 
and we are ready to introduce change. So if uh, you want to introduce change in the organization, it's always good to start with the woman, send the woman first. And then problem solvers and ready to compromise. At the same time for the future, they need mentoring, they need coaching, they need access to the networks. They need to be able to take criticism in a constructive way. And inner path is similar, steadfast to the values, steadfast to the convictions. And what I liked that was often repeated, don't be afraid, just stand up and be counted. I talked about the barriers to follow up. We did a study about the barriers that women uh, encounter in their work in business, academia, and healthcare. And these are some of them. During the, the course that we have, we'll discuss these barriers. But they really exist. And during leadership courses, women should be able to learn, not only to know that there are these barriers because they know, but how to address them, how to protect yourself in a constructive way against these barriers. So that's what they say. The bottom line is, if we want to have a voice, we have to be at the table. We have to share our experience with those who are making the decisions and be part of decision making. And many leaders are not ideal persons, but they can lead and inspire people. They have to put a picture into somebody's mind. They need to have influence. Yes, and you see the balance thing is the last one. And now I move to next part leadership in all policies. I called it this way because we see that leadership is everywhere. Yes, in all documents. And I want to show some examples. I am from Maastricht University and here are some colleagues from academia. And I think it might be interesting what we are doing in the Netherlands concerning leadership development. So Dutch universities, the association of the Dutch universities and the Ministry of Health decided, and that came with the very nice paper, position paper, Room for Everyone's Talent, that universities can open the path for leaders as we do for researchers, for educationalists, and uh, for those who want to deal with impact in science. So you can choose to be promoted a path in the leadership in this way uh, to stimulate quality, high quality leadership in academia, not by imposing top down checklist, but by developing narratives. And this is included in HR already, how people are assessed, those who choose leadership as their development at the academia. So many universities, the Erasmus universities, the Utrecht University, and many others are showing how they are doing it. So leadership in all policies. Then if you look at important documents, for instance, the core competences in applied infectious disease epidemiology in Europe developed by ECDC, it is like American CDC or in your country CDC, you see the competences for now, but there is a portion, there is a part which includes leadership and system thinking. Yes, as part of it for public health professionals to develop. If you look at the laboratory leadership competency framework, it gives a specific context. Yes, a very important document, but laboratory, uh, experts also need leadership, and leadership is included in the document in, and has prominent place. The ASPER competency framework for public health workforce, and we were talking about public health workforce, also has leadership as part of its uh, competency frame. And I just marked leaders who catalyze change in the organization and communities and those who facilitate development of others are some of the competences which are included, but also those 
who identify, connect, and manage relationships with different stakeholders. That's needed when we talk about horizontal leadership. But is it enough? We go through crisis, and all the time something happens that shapes the reality. Do the competences or the needs of leaders change? We tried to do a test with my colleague looking at the competences, what has changed after the COVID pandemic. And it turned out that COVID uh, or any other um, event uh, like this just um, puts attention or emphasis on critical competency areas to deal with health emergencies. This is flexibility, motivation, and communication. That was again mentioned earlier. Research, analytical skills, yes, very strong scientific knowledge base, yes, but not alone, not alone. It has to be a combination. It has to be a blend of these scientific skills together with empathy and sensitivity to diversity. They work together. You remember women leaders, that why they were so effective because they were able to do this. And then epidemiology, <laughs> yes, which is uh, important. That's why immediately the skills for field epidemiologists developed by ECDC, preparedness and response competencies on local and global level. We need to be prepared and we need to know how to respond to emergencies, employability and leadership. So this seems to be most important one. But now how we develop public health leaders. So we know <laughs> what it is, but now how do we develop? We did a systematic review uh, of uh, teaching leadership in undergraduate and postgraduate medical and uh, health professionals education. And it turned out that there are different de definitions of leadership that programs use. They don't converge, they, they, I would say they diverge. <laughs> and there are different frameworks, leadership competencies that are used. Sometimes leadership is a part of a wider program. Sometimes it is only a kind of a thematic area or they have their own leadership framework. Examples, Canadian Medical Education Directives for Specialists, CAMET. I know that some of you who are doctors probably use that. And leadership is one of the components. Then there is medical leadership competency framework that is used only for medical doctors. But there is also public health leadership competency framework that is used in public health curricula at some places. There is often, when we study the definitions, a big misunderstanding between management and leadership. And very often the programs don't understand the difference and they use these terms interchangeably. But we know that failing organizations are usually overmanaged and undermanaged. So universities have used 33 frameworks to teach leadership in undergraduate medical education. And there are 19 frameworks that use thematic scope. Here is an example of the public health leadership framework and you see how many different components it has. This is the example of clinical leadership competency framework that can be also used uh, for assessment of skills. And finally, from the systematic review, I just put some examples, generally leadership framework and specific thematic frameworks. Quite interesting. You see leadership and pandemics, leadership and quality in healthcare, leadership, homeless and vulnerably housed populations. So you see that in specific context, when you work in a specific field, leadership has to be applied. So what it all means, we try to develop talents, or maybe we have these talents of public health leaders. And this is mentoring and nurturing, developing others, helping others to grow, shaping and organizing the reality, having impact and influence, networking and connecting, yes, across disciplines, across uh, borders, 
uh, of organizations and sectors, knowing and interpreting. We are experts and we need to bring science closer to society. It's communication. We need to speak the language that citizens, that, that people will understand. And we often forget about it. And then we struggle with different problems. So communication. And finally, advocating for change and impacting. These are the five talents of public health leaders. So what it takes to move from good to great, from a level one highly capable individual to level five leader who builds enduring greatness through, listen, paradoxical blend of personal humility and professional will. What it takes to move from good to great. And now the part on compassion, transformational and compassionate leadership. So in order to change, to move, we need transformational leaders. Transformational leadership is developing performance beyond expectation. The transformational leaders inspire, energize intellectually, stimulate employees. You can learn this, but at the same time, there are specific attributes that you need to have. You need to pay attention to values and beliefs, consider moral and ethical consequences of your decisions, emphasize the collective sense of mission, and also go beyond your own ego. It's so difficult for some. Display confidence and instill pride in those who work with you that they are proud that you are with them. But at the same time, transformation is bringing about change. It is developing and advancing policies. Yes, that don't work. What can we do about climate change? Is there policy that we can maybe bring to a higher level? Propose a new policy, political options, and know how to implement it, even on a small scale, in your organization, in local authority, or on a global scale. And here is an example. Uh, some of you might have heard about the WHO Bond School of Environmental Health. And in 2021, last year, they developed this school, but on a different model. And I was involved in that, but we used, apart from the topical categories like health impact assessment, environmental health and equality, environmental health risk communication, and um, unintentional injuries or health. We used the Cotter model of change. So we used the stages of change and that was a kind of horizontal uh, strength where we worked with colleagues how they can pick up an idea, bring it to a different level, propose change, identify stakeholders, and propose implementation based on the problems that they struggled with. And based on what we found out, they felt empowered that when they come back to their countries, they will be able to bring change. So that was a big success, adding, once again, leadership in all policies, adding leadership, but transformational change leadership in a very uh, technical type of training, like environmental health. So this is an example. And now I'm talking about leadership, but you may say there are so many different leadership theories. Why she didn't say anything about them? Yes, there are. There is a fantastic study by Fenner, Conceptualization of Leadership and Relevance to Health and Human Service. So relevance to health and public health. All theories, great men, trade, skills, etc., etc. So what? There are only few theories that actually are important for health, when you work in health. And this is transformational, servant leadership, complexity theory, this is system thinking. 
and also I would say distributed leadership, especially in hospitals. But these are proven theories that really work in health and social care environment. But that's not all. It is compassionate leadership that matters, especially in health. Compassionate leaders captivate hearts and deliver the results. There are two new books that I would encourage you to read, Compassionate Leadership in Health and Healthcare. And bottom line is how compassionate leadership captivate hearts and bring results. Don't be misled that being compassionate is being weak. That's not true. Being compassionate, on the other hand, is being strong. And what it means, compassionate leadership, is paying attention, noticing that there is a problem. Understanding, listening, and dialoguing with your friend, your colleague as a superior, and then responding in an empathic way, having a felt relationship with others without being overwhelmed. Because very often we make a mistake that we listen pe to people's problems and then we live these problems and we are drained and that's bad. Even if you have to say no in a compassionate way, you help. Because leaders have to say no and we have to make tough decisions. But very often we help in this way, in a compassionate way. So helping. But you have to do it with open mind, with open heart, and with open will. There is a big difference how you tackle the problems in health. So to sum up leadership, leadership journey, constant bridging, yes, moving to a better future, bringing people together. And there is a leader. Yes, the leader who is able to challenge the status quo, who is competent, who is an expert, who has knowledge, who enables others to act, who is confident, who is inclusive, who is sensitive, who is a self-reflective learner. Why we are here, continuing professional development, who is a trusting coach, but what it takes, leadership, you, might, you probably have already observed what I was saying. On one hand, courage. On another hand, humility. On one hand, you have to be strong, but you are vulnerable. And people also like to see that you are vulnerable like them and that they can help you. And that you are not afraid to say, I don't know, I need your help. Because by saying this, you grow and you earn respect. Then there is sensitivity on one hand. And on the other hand, you have to be tough. You have to make decisions. Sometimes there is no evidence to make these decisions or that decisions are tough. Balance. So it is constant living in a paradox, being a leader. If you are fine with living in a paradox, you can make a good leader. But remember that this is all about head, heart, and courage to do. Thank you very much for your attention.